And now will you join us in the call to worship in your bulletin and in your chat. Wait here for the Holy Spirit. He promised to send it. A more just world is coming. It will arrive any day now. How much longer? This waiting has gone on too long. I'm bored, lonely, scared, tired. Wait a little longer. The waiting is the coming. The waiting changes us. All action begins in stillness. It's hard to understand. This, this is, is not the change we would have chosen. Nothing is getting better. It's hard to understand, hard to believe, hard to trust, but trust the unknowing. All new life begins in the darkness. But how much must we lose? How many lives cut short? How many businesses close? How many plans canceled? The loss is staggering. Name it. Feel it. Grieve it. Don't avoid or deny it. Resurrection begins here in the emptiness of grief. Testimony this morning comes from Every Craftsman, written by Jalal Udin Rumi. I've said before that every craftsman searches for what's not there to practice his craft. A builder looks for the rotten hole where the roof caved in. A water carrier picks an empty pot. A carpenter stops at the house with no door. Workers rush toward the hint of emptiness, which they can then start to fill. Their hope, though, is for emptiness. So don't think you must avoid it. It contains what you need. Dear soul, if you were not friends with the vast nothingness inside, why would you always be casting your net into it and waiting so patiently? This invisible ocean has given you such abundance, but still you call it death, that which provides you sustenance and work. God has allowed some magical reversal to occur so that you see the scorpion pit as an object of desire and all the beautiful expanse around it as dangerous and swarming with snakes. This is how strange your fear of death and emptiness is and how perverse the attachment to what you want. The ancient testimony this morning is from Acts 1, 1 through 5. And in this reading, Luke tells us how Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit on the apostles. In the first book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus did and taught from the beginning until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While staying with them, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. This, he said, is what you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Thus ends the reading. Well, good morning again and welcome to church on Zoom and Facebook Live. We're starting to get really good at this. Um, I I'm, I'm, might start going to karaoke again when the bars open, or rather for the first time, because I'm starting to feel like I'm pretty good at this karaoke thing. Uh, 
So today is Mother's Day. And most of you probably already knew that, but if you're nodding your head right now and had actually completely forgotten, I'm gonna give you a minute to make a note for yourself that you have a phone call to make later today. And you're welcome. And if you would prefer to not have been reminded, I'm sorry. And that's completely understandable. I'm not gonna say happy Mother's Day because that may not be what it is for you and that's not what it has to be for you. Maybe you had a mother who wasn't the best of mothers or who was absent altogether. In that case, you might be having some complex and ambivalent feelings at this time every year. Or if your mother recently died, Mother's Day activates that repeating cycle of grief as you remember how much you've lost. And that's also okay. Grief never really goes away, but the waves move in and out more slowly over time. And they're especially present on significant days like these. While we've not all had the experience of being a mother or even being mothers, we each develop and emerge from the body of another. Becoming oneself is a process that begins inside the womb of someone else. And that process is what I want to talk about today. A single cell gets transformed into a complex, fully functioning human body inside the dark mystery of the womb. And it's an absolutely jaw-dropping, holy, slow, and strangely mundane process. Life continues as usual. An amazing miracle is happening right underneath the surface. And everything just goes on, just like it did before. Eating, working, sleeping, sex. But somewhere under the surface, that invisible miraculous process that has been set into motion is operating in the background all the time. The mother doesn't have to think about it. She doesn't make it happen. She doesn't plan out how many fingers are going to grow. She can't speed up the process. It has its own timeline. And even if the child is born prematurely, development will continue at a similar rate. When the gestation period is complete, a new person will exist who did not exist before. And life will no longer be life as usual. Because that's going to change everything. The text that Anne read today is about the gestation period of the early church. The book of Acts is believed to be a sequel to the compilation of Jesus stories gathered by Luke in the Gospel of Luke. It's a compan Luke was a companion of Paul. Acts opens where the book of Luke concludes with the resurrection and various reported sightings of Jesus by his followers after his death. During at least one of these sightings, Jesus tells his friends to wait until he sends the Holy Spirit. Jesus had been killed. And with him died the hope for a prophet king who would lead a rebellion against the Romans and drive them out of the land of Judah. Jesus had appeared in various forms to various people, but there were no more public appearances, no public preaching, no miraculous healing, no mass feedings of presence no wild popularity. Jesus may be alive, but so many of their hopes and dreams for the future were dead, very dead. And Jesus himself could not say he had to leave. The coming of the Holy Spirit would be a life altering spiritual awakening for the followers of Jesus. But they didn't know that. They just knew that the world they had known was gone forever. And with it, their security, their hope, their sense of identity, their purpose, their mission. You cannot see the child forming during a gestational period, but you can see the water retention, the changing shape of the body, the pregnancy waddle, the varicose veins, Many of the perceivable changes are not comfortable or pleasant. 
in moments of profound change, loss is often painfully evident long before the benefits can be experienced. While they wait for the Holy Spirit he promised he would send in his place, they're not given a task to keep themselves busy. They're left to sit in the complex emotional experience of grief, fear, and the certainty of the future and confusion that has been stirred up by the emotional roller coaster experience that they have just had. And they're only told to wait. For 40 days between the crucifixion of Jesus and Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit comes, the followers of Jesus were not doing much. Maybe some of us can relate. They were under strict orders to wait. They were gestating. They were becoming. The followers of Jesus couldn't run from their loss by immediately getting busy with charitable work. They had to sit in it and wait. When shit hits the fan, we can't just jump to the positive messages of hope and silver linings. Transformative, gestational work happens in the dark places of unknowing. It engages the deep inner realities, accepting limitations and naming our grief is a part of that transformation work. It's a part of the process. As a trained mental health professional and hospital chaplain, I'm very interested in transformational processes particularly those that lead to a significant shift in how an individual thinks, feels, or acts. What is the process that is necessary for a core part of a person's identity to shift in some way? How do we transform? How do we grow wings? I'm convinced that significant transformation only comes through a combination of major change, in our external reality. Time to process and integrate the reality of that change and its consequences, including any loss, and a willingness to engage in and trust the process without knowing where it's going. We are constantly experiencing significant transformations for our whole lives. From the moment we're conceived, until we die. And that itself is a pretty significant transformation. Many of us, as we become adults, develop the capacity to protect ourselves from frequent significant changes in our environment. But we cannot completely avoid it. It's an unavoidable reality right now for all of us that a tiny virus, many times smaller than a single bacterium, is kicking our butt as a species. I believe that just as Jesus followers experienced a significant identity shift after his death, we are also experiencing a significant change on a global level and sitting in an important gestational period, a global gestational period. This is the time to process and integrate the reality of that change including all of the loss, and to engage in and trust the transformational process. The thing about gestational time is that it looks like nothing is happening. It may seem like unproductive time because the gestational phase of transformation always happens in secret, under the surface. Many of us, myself included, are under the illusion that if I'm doing nothing, that means nothing is happening. In fact, often it takes doing nothing for something to happen. The emptiness and the dark is the fertile ground of creation. Singing birds grow quietly inside eggs before they learn to sing. Butterfly wings form inside the seemingly dead husks of cocoons. The sun rises out of the stillness of night. 
mushrooms, trees, all ground plants emerge from under the ground where we cannot see and where nothing seems to move. Our dreams come asleep and silence is what makes music possible. So what are you silently growing or becoming during this gestational time? What will emerge out of this time and out of you if you just allow it to? It takes nine months to grow a baby. It also takes nine months to grow a pineapple. We perceive one as more valuable than the other because we're human. But isn't that a bit arrogant? A pineapple plant is not disappointed that it can't grow a baby. It has no use for babies. You will become what you need to be. And you will birth what you were created to birth. You can't change the outcome by trying harder. But high levels of anxiety can negatively impact the process. There's a whole industry devoted to telling people what to do when they're pregnant, because we all want to believe that we are in some way in control of this process. But it, take it from someone who's read all the books. All of the expert advice on growing the healthiest baby boils down to two things. Take good care of yourself and try not to be too stressed. In cases that do not require some kind of medical intervention, the only thing to do is to eat good food, let it be, and trust the process. Isn't trust the process a nice phrase? It sounds so zen, mindful, wise. In my experience, it's often a final act of desperation when all my other attempts at controlling or managing a situation have failed and I'm supposed to face my own limitations. Maybe some of you are really good at just letting things be, but it's hard for the rest of us. It's painful to admit that we can take out all the top predators on this planet and drive them to extinction. We can create explosions big enough to hurl things at the moon. But a tiny thing we cannot see has the power to take us down. When face to face with my own limitations, I have two choices, despair or trust. Trust that there is some divine process out there beyond me that I do not understand, working itself out, and that it's bringing something beautiful to truth. In this waiting time, some of us are isolated in our, in our own cocoons and waiting alone, and some of us are jostling for space in the womb with spouse partners, children, parents, or roommates. We want to know what to do, how to help the process, how to fix it, how to speed it up, how long it's going to take. We want to know what the future will look like when all of this is over so we can plan for it. But we don't have that information. We're powerless to do anything but wait. Wait until the time is right. Wait until we are fully cooked. Wait until the process is complete. Don't be fooled by appearances. Waiting is not doing nothing. Waiting is hard work. Waiting is the lived spiritual practice of 
and waiting is not the opposite of working for justice. It is not the easy, complacent solution to not helping your neighbor. It is the place all true acts of justice begin. The followers of Jesus turned the world upside down. But first they had to wait. In this waiting time, what are you becoming? What new possibilities or opportunities are taking form in you that could not have otherwise formed or been imagined? Can you trust the mother God who carries you in her womb right now? Can you trust the process? What are you about to give birth to? That is beyond your own imagination. We may not be able to see the secret processes that work within us during this time. But when we emerge, you can be certain that we will be changed. And life as usual will be no more. It's not going to look like we think or hope or expect, but it's going to be okay. We won't look like we expect either. So let yourself become. Eat good food. And try not to be too stressed out. Amen. As we go from this virtual space and moment together, may we go carrying within us an awareness of our own stillness. And may all of our actions and words emerge from that creative, pregnant place of stillness. Amen. <laughs>